have you. Uh, before we go too far, wanted to point out that MetPy, while you can easily from within the notebook environment, use tab to try to tab complete stuff and use the question mark to read the doc strings. There is also a um, website that has our, our documentation on it. And so it's metpy.readthedocs.io. Um, there is a shortened URL for this, but it involves, what, what is it? It's metpy.rtfd.org. Yeah. Read the fantastic docs. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So Read the Docs is um, it's a site that's run where open source projects can host their documentation for free. So this isn't anything necessarily managed by Unidata or, uh, or GitHub or something like that. So Read the Docs is a separate entity, but they, they host really nice documentation. And so um, if you want to see the examples that we have for MetPy, it's, it's available on the site. Um, that's our small but growing uh, attempt at, at, at duplicating the matplotlib gallery where you can just see a lot of different examples of what you can do. And so, for example, here's some radar stuff, level two file. So I, I like the pretty picture, and here's the code that generated it. So it's also good for browsing and seeing what's what the library can do, what it's capable of. And we'll put a link to that on the on the workshop page here at some point soon. So what we're going to go through now, um, the notebook itself is called Siphon, Cardipi, MetPy, Her. Now you've heard MetPy. How about these other things? Have you siphoned? Is that, we've mentioned it once or twice. Cardipi, have you guys heard of Cardipi before? Yeah. How about her? Have you heard of? <laughs> okay, okay, good. So let's focus on the her. So what we're going to do in this notebook is look at uh, grabbing some model output off of a data server. In this case, it's a thread server running back at Unidata. Um, and we've done this before, but in that, in that, in the examples we did, we were going out and grabbing things by using netcdf for Python and putting a URL in its data set function and then opening that. And it was just like you had the data arrays setting there on disk. And we had to do things like, well, what I'm really interested in is the data point closest to this latitude longitude corresponds to my hometown or whatever. Now I need to find out what index we were using to get that latitude and longitude so I can actually index into the array and then grab the data from that grid point closest to where I was looking. And so with OpenDAP access, which is what we were doing, everything is kind of array based. You can't say I want latitude, you know, 30, longitude, minus 105. You can't do that. You have to say I want of this temperature grid, I want index 1 through 10 for X and 5 through 17 for Y and index 0 for time. And I have no idea where that geophysically locates itself, but yay, we'll do that. And so what we're going to use now for uh, accessing data, in this case, output from the HER, uh, we're going to use something called the NetCDF subset service. So Threads has a feature where you can go to a data set. In this case, the her data we get, sorry, her model output that we get. Got to get my observationalist on here. Model output, not data. Um, sorry, no flame wars. Um, so that data actually comes across in GRIB2 format. And what I want to be able to do really is say, I went from this time to this time and say your month day format. That's what I, that's how I want to specify it because that makes sense to me. And you know, give me the data from within this latitude longitude bounding box for these variables. And that's all I want. Go ahead and send those across. Or I want the data from like time series output from the model files for this latitude and longitude point only. 
And when you're dealing with a data set like the HER, which can get, uh, we'll say, on the medium size of, uh, of big, definitely not exobytes or anything like that, but several gigabytes, if you're only interested in what's, what's the HER saying for the surface temperature uh, closest to Madison, well, you don't want to download five gigabytes or eight gigabytes of stuff just to get time series of one field at one level. That's just crazy. And so the NetCDF subset lets you do things like that. And the technology that we use in Python to speak to the NetCDF subset service is called Siphon. That's the library in Python. So Siphon, you know, you stick a hose in someone's gas tank and get a little fill up. You know, you stick a hose in the Threads data server and get your data, you're good. You don't take it all. You don't want to be greedy, but, you know, you got to you got to get into the movies and watch Finding Dory, right? So, need a little gas. Okay, enough of that. So the way we use Siphon is, um, actually there are a couple different levels you can si use Siphon. Uh, probably the most useful and what people really like to do is say, just give me the latest run of this model. And so, Inside of Siphon, we have a submodule called Catalog that refers to the Threads catalogs, which I showed yesterday. There are these XML-looking thing, or it's an XML document that I showed in the browser. It doesn't look too fun to play with. Siphon understands all of that and makes it easy to access. Um, and so, what we're gonna, what we do, and I'll bring this up again. So this is her output from Incep on a 2.5 kilometer conus grid. Um, it gets updated every hour. And from our thread server, this is the thing that we're gonna actually interface with. So a bunch of gnarly looking XML, hooray. But you guys don't have to know about that. And if I just change this extension to HTML, it looks a little prettier to work with. Um, you certainly could go back and grab <clears throat> these runs from previous runs of the model that we do have. Most, most of the time you're going to be interested in latest. And so the latest that we have right now is from 14Z on the 21st. Um, and you can go through the web browser and, and work with this stuff. And just a quick piece here about the different access. These are all different access methods of getting at the data. There's OpenDAP like we've done before. Um, if you're really big into metadata and metadata standards, you can look at the ISO metadata associated with this data set. It's another happy XML document. So Threads basically gives you ways of different ways of viewing a data set. And one of them, like I said, is NetCDF subset service. And so there's a little user page where you can go in and select what variables you want, give it a bounding box. So I can say, you know what, I want wind speed above the ground and the maximum wind speed over a one, one hour interval. Um, uh, some freezing rain stuff, why not? What's the medium cloud cover fraction? That's good. And what this is doing down here is it's, and I know you guys in the back won't be able to see it very well. So if I do this and I do this, I'll pump this way up. This little point and click form that I've brought up here, it's making a URL at the bottom. And so like Ryan showed with the Wyoming site, we construct a URL that gives you the data you want. What Siphon is doing is constructing that URL for you. Now, if you're doing the, you're asking for data from kind of a latitude longitude box around the grid, you have a few different choices of output. You can get NetCDF3 or NetCDF4. But if instead you're actually wanting to go into the, into the grid and, and just get time series from one grid point or a few grid points, then we can return the data as XML if you hate your life, CSV if that's your thing, or you can get a NetCDF or NetCDF4 um, climate and forecast compliant file back with all the metadata and whatnot. And so you can go through and click through the pages and get what you want, or you can set this up to do it programmatically so you can run it in a cron job every hour 
and get your favorite time series plots or just the little domain you're interested in for maps, you can get that generated every hour for you. And so in, in the first cell, we, we've got our, our normal song and dance, matplotlib, pyplot as plt, numpy as mp, we've imported those, and the matplotlib plot, inline. So go ahead and make sure that's executed. Quick question. Uh-huh. Um, frequently when I try to get the latest model run, it's mm -hmm. only about half full. There isn't one that's full, last complete, is there? Depends on the data server you're hitting. So there was an older version of threads that would, we, we basically waited until we thought that the file was full because these grids are coming across the LDM and you're not guaranteed an order and you're not guaranteed that all, all the grids from one model run are going to come in at once contiguously. So you could have some her grids come in and then level two grids come across and start getting written to disk and whatnot. So you never really know when it's done. There's, there's no way to know when it's done using the LDM. And we have since fixed that um, in, in the threads 4.6.x release. So any of the 4.6 versions, they're going to wait to expose that file until it's full. So depending on which, which version of the thread server you're, you're talking to, wherever you're getting your data, um, you may or may not get incomplete stuff. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we've got the catalog that, that contains a list of all the files that we've saved. We only keep three days of the her because it's pretty big. Um, and what we're gonna do is say, from this list of all files that are available, just give us the URL that, that tells us this is the latest one. That's all we want to deal with. And so that's what we're doing here. And then we have our siphon import. So from siphon ncss, import ncss. And so in order to initialize that, you pass in the catalog URL, and then you've got this object called ncss. And then what you do is you build up a query. So you're saying, this, these are the things I want to deal with. And so we create a query object. And then what we've done here is just separated out. These are the Latin lawns I'm interested in. And in this case, we've defined a central Latin lawn and then a width and a height in terms of latitude and longitude. Um, what NCSS really takes is uh, a bounding box so a west and east, a north and a south. But you know, sometimes it's easy to say, I know my city and I would like to look at about 20 degrees of stuff around it. So in this case, we've done lat, lawn, width, and height. So I'm just going to go ahead and run that. That's done. So that's set up sort of our, our basic object for getting NCSS data. And we've started the process of making a query. And so in then cell three, we're actually making the query. Now here we've chained together everything. And so we have query dot all times. So this is saying, give me all the times in this, this model run. And then we have chained onto that a dot accept. We want to accept netcdf4 as our file return format. And then we have chained onto that a dot variables. We want temperature height above the ground. And then that line got long, so we decided, okay, we're going to start adding on to the query in a new line. So query dot, we're adding a lat lawn bounding box. So here I've defined north, south, east, and west by using half the width and half the height and a plus and a minus to make a box. And so that sets up our query. And then finally, to get the data, we pass that query into the NCSS object, and we get a net CDF file. We're going to do this a few times. So if that all sounds crazy, you'll get to go through it again and, and set up these different queries. So we'll go ahead and execute. Make sure we execute itself two and cell three. And so what this is doing right now is it's going out to the thread server and it's saying, hey, Hey, Threads, I want you to go into this really big model file and dig out the data I'm interested in and only give me that back. 
And so depending on the data set size, it can take some time. So that took a, you know, 10 seconds maybe to go and fulfill that request. And so now I've got the data back that I wanted. And so what exactly do we get from that? We get this thing called NC and it looks, it's actually what you would get from opening a file in NetCDF for Python. So you get that NetCDF file object. So this should look somewhat familiar from the reading, the reading NetCDF, um, reading NetCDF notebook we did yesterday. And so within here we can, we can do things, we can look at, for example, I'm gonna go ahead and insert a cell here. So I could say NC dot variables. Uh, um, so remember variables is a dictionary. So that's what NC dot variables looks like. But if we said, hey, give me the keys of you, Mr. Dictionary. And now we've got the data that came back from the thread server. So we asked for temperature. That was the only thing we asked for. But it also gave us uh, a time variable, the height above ground, an X and a Y. And so we can look and see what those all mean. But there's also something, some projection information in here. So if you have X and you have Y, and that's just the X and Y grid that the model was run on, it's really difficult to plot that down on a map and make sense of it. And so Thread sends back some extra information about the projection that was used that these data should be projected on. Um, and we're going to use that to plot this field on a globe. And so that takes a little bit of work, but it's not too horrible. So first thing we'll do is we'll grab our, our uh, temperature variable. And I've just called this generically ncvar because as one of the exercises, you'll go back and grab a different variable and see how that works. Um, and so here's what we've got. We know the units. We know um, if there's a missing value. We know the projection that's associated with it through the grid mapping uh, attribute. Here's the shape. So it's a 16 by 1. So 16 times, there's only one height because it's temperature at the surface, and then 973 by 949 grid. And so that, that gave us our data over the lawn bounding box. Again, this is two and a half on a two and a half kilometer grid, so it can get pretty big. Um, and we didn't make a really super big request, and already we're up to almost 1,000 by 1,000. If we want to look at what the grid mapping variable tells us, we can grab the grid mapping. And so it's a Lambert conformal projection. That's just the name of the variable, but if we look at the, the grid mapping name, we have Lambert conformal conic. And then we have some projection parameters. So this is the radius of the Earth they used when they did their projection stuff, the standard parallel, the central meridian, the origin. And when you go to set up a projection, those are the parameters you would need to actually define what the projection is. So you can say, this X and Y coordinate is actually latitude, longitude, this, which is ultimately what we want. We want some nice way of getting latitude and longitudes out of this X, Y grid. And so what we are going to do is we define lat zero, lawn zero, lat one, earth radius, just by grabbing out uh, from the grid uh, variable that we created, just grabbing out the standard parallel, the latitude of the projection origin, those things. We just define those as variables to kind of cut down on the size of getting that information in terms of the number of characters we have to type. Now we can actually look at doing a projection. So the projection library we use is Cardopy. You may have heard of base map. How many have heard of base map somewhere? Okay, so um, base map is also maintained by Jeff Whitaker, who does NetCDF for Python. And base map kind of works for the things that he intended it to do. Um, going beyond that, you run into some, some corner case issues. And even at this point, I think Jeff is moving over to using Cardopy. 
Carter P is, is like the, the meteorological package that comes out of the UK Met Office and that it's developed by the UK Met Office. Um, but it's only fo fo focused on doing projection math. So if you want to do projection stuff, Carter P is the way to go. So we'll go ahead and, and import that library um, and start grabbing the X and Y grid information we need in order to do the projection. So from the netcdf file we got back from the thread server, we have a variable called X and Y. And since it's in a netcdf file, we can very easily ask for the units that come off of X and Y. There's a typo there. There we go. So I'm saying we're going to have a variable X. And this says, hey, netcdf file, give me all of the data back from variable X. And then here we're saying, let's attach a unit of whatever that unit's attribute from the netcdf file says. And so we haven't went in and hard-coded any units like we did in the previous example with the upper air data. We're just grabbing what's actually in the file force to use. And we run that, and we print out what the units are, and right now it's in kilometers. Now, if you read the Cardopy docs, Cardopy really wants things in meters, not kilometers. So we can use MetPy and change the units on X and Y to meters. And now we know we're, we're pretty happy. We've got, at least got X and Y ready to go in meters that will end up coming out in a lat long projected space. So there's some work that's done to set up um, kind of the plotting environment you're going to plot on. Um, as well as the coordinate reference system. In this case, that's the, the Lambert conformal. And these can change based on the model that you're looking at. For example, a global model is just going to be on a cylindrical coordinate system, a cylindrical grid. Um, but everything in that grid mapping parameter that comes back across from the thread server will have that mapping information in it. So you can always get to the parameters you need to set up the appropriate coordinate system. Now this does get a little tricky and a little confusing, especially if you're not familiar with projections and projection math. So for now, we're just going to go with it, execute those cells to set up our projection system. Um, and then we'll look at the shape of, of our variables. So we have an X, we have a Y. And then this NC var, that's our, our surface temperature variable. And so X has a shape of 949, 973 for Y. And then we have 16 times in one height. The times that you get back, what I'll do is show you what that looks like. Insert cell above. Actually, I'll go ahead and run this. And let me print these out since there are so few of them. The times that we get back, these are hours since 2006, 621, 15Z. Um, and so what we'd really like to do is get that into something Python knows how to work with. In this case, it's a date time object. So there's a little bit of code here that goes through and finds out the appropriate time variable to use. Because within a grip file, there are actually several time coordinates, um, anywhere from 1 to 15, depending on what data is there. A lot of that has to do with variables being averaged over different averaging times. So you'll have a three-hour precip average, a five-hour precip average. Each one of those gets its own time coordinate. And so figuring out which time coordinate you want to use is a little tricky, but that's what this code is doing here. It's basically going through the list of dimensions and finding the ones that have time in them, so we know it's a time dimension, and then matching that up with the one that the variable actually uses. And so this code basically takes this kind of thing, hour since, a start date, and turns it into a date time object. Finally, we're going we're gonna to see some pretty. 
So at the top of the cell, we've defined time step as zero. So that's just going to be the initial forecast time. Initial forecast time does not mean analysis. Keep that in mind. A lot of the, the model files we serve on threads, we have a separate collection for the analysis fields. So forecast time zero is not analysis time. That's the analysis time that's been through at least one integration step to sort of try and make the model physics consistent is what the catchphrase NCEP uses. But so we're actually dealing with forecast time zero, not analysis time. And we've got a little thing here where we're importing these things called features. I'll show you what that does in a second, but it basically gives us things like state boundaries and whatnot. So we do our typical plotting thing. We create a figure, we add an axis, but there's an interesting thing we're passing into axes here. We're passing in this projection information. And with Cartopy and matplotlib, they work together to use that information to actually geolocate your XY grid and plot it. And so once you set up your figure, then we can do something like a P color mesh. We give it our X coordinate, our Y coordinate. Here's our temperature and we're just giving a, a time step. Um, we give it the transform that we're interested in using, so our coordinate reference system, and I've given it here a color map. These are all just keyword arguments to, to the plot function, or in this case, p-color mesh. And then for fun, I'm gonna mark on this figure with an X, the center of our lat-lon bounding box. So we specified a square lat-lon bounding box. Our grid, isn't going to necessarily come out looking like a square there because we're projected. That's why I wanted to go ahead and put the X in there for you guys. And then some common features like coastlines, the states, borders, geographical borders, things like that. And then we'll add some grid lines and a title. Here I'm grabbing the title from the time step that we, we used and telling it to put that out in an ISO formatted time step. And so it takes a little bit of time to generate this image but not too terrible. And so there's our, our surface temperature field um, using the lap lawn box we define, projected on a map. It's not necessarily the easiest thing to get data from a model onto a map that you ran on a, an XY grid, but that's what we've done. Um, the thing to be careful about, Cardopy, just like matplotlib and just like we're trying to do in MetPy, has a wonderful gallery of examples. None of those examples deal with taking an XY grid and projecting it into geophysical space. And so when you go to do this on your own, the best place to start is probably gonna be in the MetPy documentation or in our workshop documentation. Most people have the luxury of getting a lat long grid back for them from the data set. And when you're getting uh, data from NSEP, they try to minimize the amount of stuff they send back. So a two-dimensional latitude and a two-dimensional longitude grid, that can get beefy. But a 1DX and a 1DY with a, with a very simple variable with just attributes of the projection on it, that's much smaller to transport across the network. And so that's a little bit of reason why we're stuck where we are, but we can deal with it. It's just a little tricky. So things to consider or try with this notebook. Change the uh, width and height of the bounding box that you requested or the center, where you want to center your bounding box over and then run it, see what happens. Um, in this case, we didn't plot a color bar with it, so we have no idea of what the reds and the blues actually mean. And this is actually a, a diverging color bar between uh, red and blue. And so the whites are gonna be whatever the middle kind of mean temperature is in this uh, this image. Now we could attach a color bar to it. And I think later in an example we do that. But given all the projection stuff, it's probably overloaded your brain somewhat. So we won't worry about that quite yet. But those are that is something you can do. So if you want, just take a few minutes, 
and play around. You could also change the variable that you're trying to show. You don't have to use temperature. You could um, look at any of the numerous uh, variables that the HER has to play with. Or are you guys all brain dead? <laughs> Okay, I'll tell you what, we've, we've already done upper air stuff, but at the end of this notebook, there's an example of doing a skew T using model output. So what would that look like? And the spoiler alert here is it's pretty much the exact same as we did with the point stuff, or as the observational stuff. It's just we're defining our pressure, our temperature, and our dew point variables from model output instead of from the sond. Um, in this case, we're using the NCSS service to do a point request. So we're saying, give me the temperature, the dew point, the U and V components of wind from the vertical line above this grid point. And thread says, okay, I can do that. And so it goes out and you give it a lat long. And then you say, give me the vertical profiles of these variables and it'll do that for you. Um, Again, we're digging into a really big grid. It takes a little time to actually for the server to go in and figure out where that data lives. Um, if you know about GRIB itself, everything is a 2D slice. And so when you're doing vertical profiles, you're, you're actually jumping around on disk quite a bit to go to these different vertical levels. And you're only interested in one point on each one of those, so you've got to go and find that on disk assemble that together and then give that back to the user. So it takes a little bit of time, but it's not crazy. It's never gonna be a super fast operation to do, especially with grip data. But we've got our data now. I define my pressure, temp, dew point, U and V components of wind, give them units. So this is just like, like we did in the previous example, except now I'm using what's coming back to me as the unit attribute in the netcdf file, so I don't have to do that by hand. Um, and then I make sure they're in the units that I want to plot on my skew t, so make sure pressure is in millibars, in the model it's in pascals, make sure temperature is in degrees Celsius, in the model it's Kelvin, make sure U and V are in knots, that's what I want to see on my skew t, in the model it's, anybody? Meters per second, exactly, yeah. So we convert those units over, and this is the almost exact same code as you ran to make SQT, even though it's very, it's, it's very different source of data. And so that's what the, the her coming from NCEP SQT looks like for today over Boulder. So. Why do you think it only um reduced to mean sea level pressure, maybe? Um, let me make sure here. What point did I grab? I'm pretty sure I, I put the boulder lat lawn in here. You could, of course, change it. Uh, let's see. You can change one lines before, so yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that's from the HER coming from NSEP over Boulder. So there are a few funky things, like you said, a thousand millibars, what? Um, what else? Smooth, not very many points. Not very many points, smooth. It only goes up to 500. Why does it only go up to 500? That's all NCEP gives us for the HER. That's all they send out, up to 500 millibars. So that's what we've got. Yep. Over NOAA port. Over NOAA port. You can get the HR files, but they're like 30 gig. Yeah. Yeah. Now we do have, we do have HER files from NOAA GSD. That's the, I'll be careful saying. Experimental version of HER. Well, which is different than her X. Yes. <laughs> so it's 
is basically what NCEP is running, but with new extensions that they're developing on it to then go to operations. And so those uh, have much more information in them, many more variables, many more levels. And that's also available on a thread server. And you could use that URL, rerun this script, and get it from a, a better, better in terms of data availability data set than the NCEP per. I execute K diagrams from the forecast. I suppose by definition that have no significant levels. And because uh, you're going to get it from just the, uh, the forecast levels. And uh, would that be true for the 1000 millibar that the skew T would already look much smoother than the, than the original observation? I, I suppose it would. Actually. Um, actually, what you could do is you could go out and use what we did in the previous notebook and grab the observation that's a, that comes from the closest time to what the forecast is, is valid for and plot those in the same image and see, well, they're seeing what you missed, but then there's also what the model added and, well, again, I'm not going to go into no, the flame no, wars here. <laughs> right. So, yeah, the significant levels, I mean, when they send up a sond, it's sampling it, you know, every second. And then that gets reduced down to, we've got the mandatories, there was a cool wiggle, right? So let's put that in as a significant. Um, so those are already artificially reduced. Um, and then you have the model where you've only got these isobaric surfaces, and that's all you're going to get. So, yeah, you're going to be missing a lot of stuff in these. But it can be done. As always, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, but it can be done. And, and there, are, there are better data sets to use than the HER. But in this case, I used HER because it is a super big file on disk and um, definitely something I want to try to do locally, sifting through, trying to figure out this is the latitude, longitude point I want in the grid. Now give me this thing. It's nice to pass that off to a server somewhere and say, you go do this and then give me what I asked for. That's a lot better, especially when you're dealing with different formats on disk and all of that. So we have five minutes until lunch. If you want, play around in this notebook. We'll hang out for another few minutes and uh, answer any questions you have. Otherwise, we can go get some food and come back maybe a little bit early if you want and play around with this. I'll try to be back early so that we can be here to answer questions. Um, there's a lot to chew on in this notebook, a lot. Um, but that's, that's how it goes when you're trying to do projection stuff. Any questions just off the top of your heads that you have now? Now, I will say the speed at which you get data back also does depend on the network connections. Right now, when we get data from threads, we're going back to Boulder and then shipping that data across the wire here. So I'm sure you guys are on the Internet 2 backbone at some point. We're one of the air conduit servers. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you've got a fast connection there between here and there anyways. But if you were to, say, have your own thread server, saving your own collections of real-time data, then you could go through the local network and hit that. You wouldn't have the, the masses of people that hit the thread server back at UCAR, so the response would be quicker just because of a lower server load. And we'll have that going for you guys away. life could be easier for you. Just And yeah, Pete's been working on setting up a thread server. And hopefully we can sit down and get that up and running. And then you wouldn't be hitting threads.ucar.edu. You would hit weather.aos.edu. There you go. You could get all your data goodness there. Not that we're trying to kick people off the thread server. It's just you will get better performance hitting your own. Is the cloud? Or no, that's not. That's a web server. Yeah, server is the 
Well, there's, there's the next red level two, one, two, left. Yep. And of course, there you're on. Oh God, you're going through like InfiniBand connecting the different servers. So if you're requesting data from inside the AWS data center, then you're like really, really on fire speed wise. Data IO becomes less of an issue. <laughs> That's pie in the sky at this point there. One of the cool things Ryan's working on right now is uh, getting a getting a, a Jupyter server to talk with threads. So to talk with the Java, such that you could pass processing routines potentially to a thread server and do some computations there just by writing Python stuff and get threads to return that to you. So if you're looking for I mean, the, the very basic data processing stuff is some kind of grid averaging or, um, well, yeah, grid averaging basically is what you can do on, on the most cutting edge servers at this point. But let's say you wanted to get back um, you know, let's say you want to get back something as simple as vorticity, but they only gave you UNV and oh, the grid is global at, you know, 20 kilometers or not 20 kilometers at, at we'll say five kilometers global grid. That's crazy. But imagine that you want to calculate vorticity or look at average vorticity over a one degree latitude longitude bounding box, but your data were on that five kilometer global grid. Do you want to pull back a five kilometer global grid of U and pull back five kilometer grid of V? Try to load that into your computer's memory and compute vorticity from that and then average that. Or would you like to say, hey, use these two fields over here on your server that you've already got access to, compute the vorticity and go ahead and average that over a one degree box. Then send that back to me and I'll decide if I want something more fine scale or not. Big difference. And we're very quickly approaching the point to, at which even technology like the LDM is not going to cut it anymore. There's not going to be shipping grids across for everyone in the brother, brother to look at. Data will be generated and kept on site and you're going to have to come smartly ask for what you want. Unless you're generating your own data. In which case you may want to have that generated and something set on top of that so that you can smartly access your own data sets without trying to do crazy stuff. That, I would say we're actually pretty much at that point, but scary new world, man. Food, food questions, food questions, beer, food. Questions? Lunch has it. All right. We'll be back at. We'll one, be back at one. I think we're supposed to convene on the schedule at. One fifteen. Okay. okay.